Well, hello and uh, welcome all to this session on ward monitoring. Um, we have titled the session, Making the Leap to Ward Monitoring 4.0. And I have the great pleasure of introducing um, some expert colleagues and collaborators and people who have really established uh, a, a, a presence in the world of ward monitoring. Ward monitoring, as all of us know, is the one area where uh, we need to do a lot of work, where there is a lot of exciting work going on, but I honestly feel we can do way better than we are doing right now. So um, I'm hoping that this is going to be a session that's going to uh, really enhance all of y'all's knowledge on what is ward monitoring, what is the best way to monitor our patients, and what we can do. What does the future hold? Is the future uh, really exciting? What are the challenges? And how we can get to better patient safety outcomes for our patients on the general hospital ward. So the three speakers today um, come from, uh, come from uh, the European Union and the United Kingdom. Uh, first up, we'll have Professor uh, Bernd Sagel. Um, he is Professor of Anesthesiology and uh, Vice Chair of the Department of Anesthesiology in the Center of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicine at the University Medical Center Hamburg-Eppendorf in Hamburg, Germany. Bernd um, is a, a well-established name in the world of perioperative monitoring. He's a chair of the Scientific Subcommittee 14, which is monitoring ultrasound and equipment of the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. Following Bernd, uh, we're going to have uh, Professor Frederick Michard. Um, he is a critical care MD-PhD. He's based in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, Frederick has a very rich history of being involved in ward monitoring and an incredibly rich history of training all over the world. He trained in the Paris University Hospitals and then in Boston at, at the very famous Mass General Hospital, that's Harvard Medical School, where he did anesthesia and critical care. Um, he is known for his research work and publications and, and lots and lots of publications, over 10,000 citations for Google Scholar, um, lots and lots of work on pulse pressure variation, fluid responsiveness, and more recently on digital innovations and uh, wearable sensors. And um, he will be talking about a lot of digital innovations and wearable sensors in his talk today. And finally, um, last but certainly not the least, we have uh, Dr. Sadia Khan. Uh, Dr. Khan is a consultant cardiologist at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospitals, uh, the NHS Foundation Trust and Imperial College in London, the United Kingdom. And she will really uh, follow up and tell us how a real world experience of uh, real time continuous ward monitoring and implementation works. And um, I am the chair of this session. Uh, my name is um, Ashish Khanna. I'm associate professor and vice chair for research with the Department of Anesthesiology and the section on critical care medicine at the Wake Forest School of Medicine in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. There are 900 bedded university hospital and uh, we do lots and lots of work on perioperative outcomes research and um, lots and lots of work with continuous perioperative monitoring systems. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to start the session. The three talks will go um, back to back. And at the end of the three talks, we have lots and lots of time for some interesting discussion. Please send us your questions and uh, we will we'll be happy to take all of those questions at the end of the talks. We're gonna start with uh, Professor Salo. Hello, my name is Bernd Salo. In this first talk of the session on ward monitoring, I will explain why current ward monitoring must be changed. These are my conflicts of interest. Imagine someone you love had major surgery this morning. Your telephone rings and the surgeon tells you surgery went well and everything is fine. Your relative is still in the operating room but you can visit 
this afternoon on the board. Each day, thousands of patient families receive relieving phone calls like this. A call probably better reflecting clinical reality would be, hey, surgery went well and everything is fine so far, but the most dangerous time is still ahead. The postoperative period poses a much higher risk for patients than surgery itself. And indeed, intraoperative mortality today is very, very low. As a matter of fact, preventable anesthesia-associated mortality decreased by a factor of 100 during the last century. In contrast to intraoperative mortality, postoperative mortality, mortality after surgery is not low. It is 100 times more common than intraoperative mortality. To put that differently, we can say that when we would consider the month after surgery a disease, it would be the third leading cause of death globally. This is the user study that was published in 2012. It was a seven day cohort study in almost 500 hospitals across Europe. And it described in hospital mortality after non-cardiac surgery. In-hospital mortality after non-cardiac surgery in the user study was 4%. Of course, mortality rates varied considerably among different countries and ranged from roughly 1% to 20%. But in most of the European countries, postoperative mortality was somewhere around 2 to 6%. So is postoperative mortality a European problem? It is not, it is also a problem in the United States. This is a study from the United States and it reports an incidence of death within the first month after surgery and patients having inpatient surgery of 2.1%. And this translates to a mortality rate of one to 49. So about 2% of patients having major non cardiac surgery die within the first month after surgery. Reasonable questions then are when, where, and why do patients die after surgery? Answers to these questions are given in an interesting secondary analysis of the vision study, including more than 40,000 patients. Mortality rate in this secondary analysis was 1.8% within the first 30 days after surgery. So this is very similar to what was reported in the user study and in the, another, in the other study from the United States that I just showed you. This is a relation between postoperative days on the x-axis and the cumulative percentage of patients who died on the y-axis. One may assume that patients die after surgery very soon in the first days, or one may assume that it takes a couple of days until the complications develop and that patients start dying then. But in fact, you can see from this figure that we lose patients every day after surgery. Where do these, do these patients die? In this study, 0.7% of patients died in the operating room. 70% of patients died during the index hospital stay, and 29% of patients died after hospital discharge. This translates into absolute numbers of five patients who died in the operating room, 500 patients who died during the index hospital stay, and 210 patients who died after hospital discharge. Let's Briefly jump back to the user study. Interestingly, 73% of patients who died were never admitted to an intensive care unit at any stage after surgery. So why do patients die? The secondary analysis of the vision study identified that there are main postoperative complications that are associated with postoperative death. Those complications were major bleeding, 
myocardial injury, sepsis, acute kidney injury, stroke, venous thromboembolism, congestive heart failure, and new atrial fibrillation. Three of those major complications were the main contributors to post operative death, and this were major bleeding, myocardial injury, and sepsis. You may ask, what does all of this have to do with post operative work monitoring? And the answer is all of those major post operative complications cause alterations in vital signs, alterations, for example, in respiratory rate, peripheral oxygen saturation heart rate, or blood pressure. The key question regarding monitoring then is how do we monitor patients having surgery? And you will agree that we, will, that we, you, uh, that we monitor patients very closely during surgery in the operating room. So in the operating room, we have high frequent or continuous monitoring of cardiovascular dynamics, respiratory variables. And I would even say that um, a patient is never monitored more closely than during the few hours of surgery. On the normal ward before surgery and on the normal ward after surgery, we perform spot checks by nurses in intervals of usually four to eight hours. Cardiovascular variables and other vital signs at home before hospital admission or at home after hospital discharge are largely unknown. So vital signs during these periods are large black boxes. Let's just, for example, look at three vital signs as an example, how we monitor those variables at the moment and what are problems related to ward monitoring of these variables. Let's start with respiratory rate. This is a retrospective observation and study of ward patients and all vital signs collected um, in the 48 hours before adverse events were analyzed. Interestingly, respiratory rate was documented in only 30% of nurse assessments, meaning that respiratory rate is measured and determined unfrequently. Even if respiratory rate is documented in the charts, we know from this very interesting um, analysis that the respiratory rates monitored in the nurse's chart are usually either 18 or 20, simply, be, simply because nurses consider those respiratory rates normal and those respiratory rates can be easily calculated during bedside assessment. It is a problem that we monitor respiratory rate infrequently and documented incorrectly because respiratory rate is a very important variable when it comes to predicting clinical deterioration on normal works. What about peripheral oxygen saturation? This is a prospective observation and study of blinded SpO2 monitoring in more than 800 patients after non-cardiac surgery. You can see that more than 20% of patients had more than 10 minutes of an SpO2 less than 90% and 8% of patients even had more than 20 minutes with an SpO2 of less than 90%. However, routine four to six hour spot check monitoring missed 90% of the hypoxemic events and only 5% of the patients had even a single SpO2 value of less than 90% documented in the nursing records. This means that hypoxia is profound and it is often missed by current intermittent monitoring. Blood pressure is a very important cardiovascular variable. And this sub-study of the POIS-2 trial shows that hypotension is a problem after surgery on normal works. Hypotension was defined as a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters of mercury requiring treatment. And you can see that almost 35% of patients had hypotension during surgery. We call this intraoperative hypotension. More than 30% had hypotension on the remaining day of surgery, and almost 8% had hypotension on postoperative days one to four. Interestingly, there was new onset hypotension. That means that uh, there was hypotension in patients who were not hypotensive during surgery, but who became hypotensive on the remaining day of surgery or on postoperative days one to four. 
This is the association between hypotension and the risk, the odds ratio for myocardial injury and death. And here we can see the odds ratio for 10 to 30 minutes of intraoperative hypotension for 10 and 30 minutes of hypotension on the remaining day of surgery. And this is the odds ratio for any hypotension on postoperative days one to four. This is another interesting study on postoperative hypertension in more than 1,700 non cardiac surgery patients who were treated on a high dependency unit for the first 24 hours after surgery. Again, postoperative hypertension was common, and about 10% of patients had two cumulative hours of a mediatory pressure of less than 60, and half of the patients had four cumulative hours of a mediatory pressure of less than 75. Even more importantly, Postoperative hypotension was associated with postoperative myocardial injury. This study on the incidence, severity, and detection of blood pressure alterations after abdominal surgery shows continuous 15, 30, and 60 minutes of hypotension below certain blood pressure thresholds. And you can see that hypotension again was profound and prolonged. Hypotension defined as a mean arterial pressure of less than 65 was detected by intermittent spot check vital sign assessment in only 21% of the cases. So at the moment, we perform intermittent spot check uh, monitoring on normal wards. That means a patient may be well at 4 in the morning, there is a clinical event, a clinical deterioration at 4.40, and we may only notice this during uh, nursing rounds in the morning a couple of hours later. This means that we recognize clinical events deterioration late and we cannot intervene early. In theory, continuous ward monitoring with bedside continuous monitoring would allow to detect a clinical event or deterioration just immediately. It allows us to alarm a nurse or a red response team and this can allow to recognize deterioration immediately and intervene fast within a couple of minutes. In the future, maybe all of our patients on hospital wards will be monitored with continuous real-time ward monitoring. Information from real-time ward monitoring together with information from electronic health records and laboratory results can go through an artificial intelligence engine and be transferred to a command center where a clinician reviews selected patients and can notify, notify ward nurses or rapid response teams. To summarize, about 2% of patients die within the first month after major non-cardiac surgery. Two thirds of these patients die during the hospital stay under our direct supervision only one third of those patients die after hospital discharge. Postoperative death are caused by major postoperative complications. These major postoperative complications cause alterations in vital signs. These alterations in vital signs are missed by current work monitoring that mainly consists of spot checks by nurses every four to eight hours. In the next talk, we will learn how to perform continuous ward monitoring to eventually improve patient outcome. In my opinion, we, we want to further advance and implement ward monitoring. We need to be smart. That means we need to select patients wisely. We need to develop monitoring systems for continuous ward monitoring. We need to handle alarms. We need to organize a rapid response by nurses or rapid response teams. And we need to learn much more about the treatment of alterations in vital signs in patients treating, treated on normal wards. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. So how to ensure high quality monitoring? Uh, before I start, let me disclose the fact I'm today leading our consulting and research company based in Switzerland and where we focus on digital innovations with medical applications. And I'd like to quickly remind you why we should monitor our patients differently using a mnemonic monitor. 
First of all, because many high-risk surgical patients develop post-operative complications that may be detected with a delay. We know from the large international surgical outcome study that 27% of patients undergoing major surgery are going to develop at least one post-operative complication. Opioids may induce respiratory depression, and there is today a consensus to say that no patient should be harmed by opioids because opioid-induced respiratory depression is a complication 100% preventable. The nurse-to-patient ratio is often suboptimal, uh, on the words, not to say far too low. And we know from uh, studies that there is a relationship, an inverse relationship between failure to rescue, that is to say deaths related to postoperative complication, and the nurse staffing level. In hospital cardiac arrest often occur on the wards. This is a very interesting audit study published by the group of Jerry Nolan a few years ago. They collected data from over 140 acute hospitals in the UK, 23,000, more than 23,000 in hospital cardiac arrest, and more than half of these arrests were actually uh, occurring on regular wards. There is also today a trend towards the admission of older patients with multiple comorbidities who are obviously at high risk of clinical deterioration. And we learned as well from this international surgical outcome study that when patients have significant morbidities, ASA 3 4, um, more than 30% of these patients develop at least one postoperative complication. Overwhelmed ICUs cannot cope with the surge of acutely ill patients. We knew that, but it became, of course, obvious during this pandemic. And that's why with Bernd Sogol and Benoit Vallée, we proposed uh, to not only increase the number of ICU beds, but also to upgrade the way we monitor patients on uh, the regular floor. Finally, remote and wireless monitoring solutions are now available. And so we have the opportunity to upgrade the way we monitor patients on the but how to ensure high quality world monitoring? First of all, uh, by offering continuous monitoring. We know from several studies that uh, it may be associated with uh, outcome improvement. These are studies, prospective or retrospective before after studies, including a very large number of patients. The first one was uh, published by Andreas Tenzer already 10 years ago, and they used the pulse oximeter to monitor pulse rate and SpO2 continuously in a large number of orthopedic patients and observed a significant decrease in the number of rescue events in the unit where they uh, implemented this new strategy as compared to what was observed in uh, two control units, unit one and unit two. They also reported a significant decrease in the number of ICU transfer, and it makes sense to believe that if we could or if we can uh, detect clinical deterioration at a very early stage, uh, it's going to be possible to prevent, if not all, at least some ICU admissions. Another outcome study done with a different system, it's a piezoelectric system. You can live under the mattress to monitor heart rate and respiratory rate, and in these uh, large study, the authors reported a significant decrease in the number of calls for cardiac arrest. Capnography has been shown to be useful as well. That's a study where um, the authors showed that continuous capnography in patients receiving opioids was associated with a significant decrease in the number of rapid response events associated with naloxone administration. Another interesting study from Chris Soube, Bernd Doller, and Rinaldo Bellomo, a study done in the UK. Uh, many patients were actually um, wearing uh, wireless sensors, and uh, it was a combination of sensor, a pulse oximeter, a patch on the abdomen for monitoring respiratory rate, and a wireless bike cuff, as you can see on the picture. And after implementing these kind of monitoring solutions, the author reported a significant decrease in cardiac arrest and mortality. Another example of monitoring system, which has been specifically designed uh, for uh, monitoring patients on the wards, combining electrodes for ECG uh, monitoring, uh, a pulse oximeter, and providing as well uh, blood pressure continuously from the pulse wave transit time method 
um, a technique, a method, which is, as you probably know, or, or requires uh, intermittent calibration from uh, an oscillometric bracket cuff from time to time. And so this system was used as well in these uh, outcome study done in uh, neuro patients and neurosurgical patients. And once again, the authors reported a significant decrease in the number of rapid response team events. In addition, there are uh, new products, new uh, tools which have been approved for medical use and which have not yet been part of uh, outcome studies, adhesive patches, necklaces, or uh, finger sensors, or the combination of uh, electrodes to monitor respiratory rate and uh, pulse oximeters uh, to monitor continuously a SpO2 and uh, pulse rate. So to ensure high quality monitoring, also by selecting the right patients. Obviously, we're not going to monitor continuously all inpatients. And so to select patients at high risk of uh, developing complications, of uh, developing uh, severe adverse events, of course, we can rely on uh, our clinical evaluation. That's what we have done during years. That's what we will probably continue to do in many hospitals. Otherwise, you can use scores, early warning scores, the news, the muse. You can use a SORT score. You can use a Prodigy score developed by Ashishkana. You can use many other scores which have been designed uh, to predict clinical deterioration. You can even use uh, scores uh, developed or derived from machine learning algorithm like the ECART or the Haven, and there are many others coming. Um, you have actually many options uh, to uh, identify patients at high risk of clinical deterioration who logically uh, should benefit from uh, continuous monitoring on the wards. Another requirement to, uh, for a successful implementation is of course uh, sensor accuracy. And it's important to realize that all sensors are not born equal. I'm just using here the example of um, respiratory rate monitoring. You probably know that many different techniques and methods have been proposed to monitor respiratory rate. Uh, but validation studies clearly have uh, yielded uh, conflicting results. Here you see the example of a small patch analyzing ECG variability and data from the accelerometer, which is part of the patch, uh, to compute respiratory rate. It was part of this uh, validation study published in anesthesiology last year by the Martin Breteller uh, from the team of uh, Cork Kalkman. And they showed that uh, only 77% uh, of the measurements were actually in the safe uh, zones A and B of the Clark Air grid. This new wireless uh, sensor, which is based on uh, impedance pneumographic uh, method, was evaluated in this uh, study recently published in Journal of Clinical Monitoring and Computing. Um, the authors used uh, capnography as a reference method and showed that over 99% of the measurements were in uh, the safe zones. What we need as well are mobile solutions. I'm well aware there are what I usually describe as stay-in-bed solutions, like capnography or these uh, piezoelectric sensor or bed sensor I previously described. But we all know that uh, we need mobile solutions because we want patients to be able to leave their bed, even to leave their room for physiotherapy. Early mobilization is indeed a key element of uh, enhanced recovery after surgery programs. So we need mobile solutions. We need monitoring systems able to follow patients wherever they go. The connectivity has to be robust as well. And for home monitoring, you probably know that more and more systems are actually relying on Bluetooth. It's pretty convenient because most of the time patients are using their own smartphone uh, as a getaway to transmit the information. But we have to realize that uh, at home patients are not very sick and uh, intermittent measurements are probably enough. Um, today we don't monitor patients at all. So having uh, physiologic information from time to time is already a significant step forward. Uh, this is an interesting study coming from the Nightingale project. Uh, uh, co-signed again by Martin Breteller and Cor Kalkman, uh, showing in 20 patients who were monitored from home, uh, disruptions, uh, the frequency of disruptions when using Bluetooth connectivity. So in green, you have uh, the percentage of available data, 
and in red, you have data loss. And you see that for some patients, actually, they spent more time uh, without uh, any uh, form of monitoring than uh, uh, with uh, effective, uh, useful uh, monitoring. But I don't think it's a big deal, honestly, for home monitoring. In the hospital, it's completely different. In the hospital, we already monitor our patients from time to time. I mean, uh, nurses do their spot checks. So we really want to upgrade to continuous and reliable continuous uh, monitoring. So we need wireless signals, which are as reliable as uh, what we get from wired connections, right? And we know that uh, it's not always the case. And this is a, a nice study published a, a few years ago by Wink uh, and collaborators showing that with this system, artifacts were pretty common and 70% of the time were actually related to connection failure. So that's why I think we need medical grade connectivity protocols. And fortunately, a few companies are um, developing them. Alarm management is uh, key as well. Um, alarms are not designed to disturb patients. They are designed to inform clinicians. And so we need to personalize thresholds. And we need also to increase the time interval between the detection of an abnormality and the alarm itself. And honestly, I think five minutes could be uh, acceptable. Of course, it would not be acceptable in the OR in the ACU, but uh, on the wards, remember today nurses spot check vital signs every four to six to eight hours. So if we had an update every five minutes, uh, that would be okay. And if you assess the median value of any vital sign over a five minutes period, it's actually a very simple, very basic way to eliminate most artifacts. We also need our monitoring systems able to uh, keep quiet, stay quiet, so that patients can recover um, in a very uh, friendly and uh, quiet uh, atmosphere. And so the idea is to have maybe sensors, of course, on patients, but the information uh, should be sent uh, via a gateway to a central station so that nurses can be informed at the central station or actually directly on their pager or smartphone. So in conclusion, you understood it's time to rethink the way we monitor our patients on hospital wards. Postoperative clinical deterioration may be overlooked for hours. Keep in mind that a nurse who would uh, spot check vital signs every four hours would probably cover around 2% of the time uh, the patient would spend in the hospital. Solutions now exist for the automatic and continuous monitoring of vital signs. They may help to improve patient safety and patient satisfaction. They may help as well to decrease ICU admissions and related costs. There are requirements for successful implementation of these new monitoring systems. We need to offer continuous monitoring uh, so that we don't miss any uh, adverse event of the right patients so that we don't waste resources uh, by focusing on patients at high risk of clinical deterioration. With accurate sensors, you understood that all sensors are not born equal, so look at validation studies. Part of mobile monitoring solutions, I think it's key as well. Uh, we need systems able to follow patients wherever they go. Uh, once again, early mobilization is uh, a key element of enhanced recovery. Connectivity has to be robust. Otherwise, uh, even if the sensor is collecting continuously information, I mean, uh, you will not get uh, continuous monitoring. And we need to personalize alarms and increase um, or accept a significant increase in annunciation delays simply in order to decrease alarm burden and uh, improve nurse adoption. So before closing this lecture, I just want to mention the fact that we are uh, with uh, Bernd Sogel, with Ashish Kana and others, we just completed uh, a large international survey on the topic to better understand the current perception and expectation of anesthesiologists who as perioperative physicians are obviously increasingly involved in postoperative care. Uh, this is for me the opportunity to thank uh, all the collaborators from Europe and from the US who made this survey possible. Uh, we got a very uh, significant uh, feedback, uh, a large number of uh, responses, and uh, next time will be my pleasure to present you the results. Thank you again for the invitation. 
And thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for asking me to give this talk today. My name is Sarah Khan and I'm a cardiology consultant working at Chatham Westminster Hospital in London. And I'm really delighted to share some of our experiences working with remote monitoring on a ward system and particularly in within the NHS environment, which to be honest, I don't think is probably that different in reality from a ward anywhere else. So just some conflicts of interest to, before I start. So I have a post as an honorary senior clinical lecturer at Imperial College and through, through both that role and my work within the trust and within the NHS setting, I've been involved both at the clinical level and in a research level with multiple remote monitoring studies and projects. And in particular, regarding this pro the system from G that I'm going to describe to you today, I've, we've done one of the first clinical studies with this system. So let me take you to the area of the world that I'm sat in at the moment. So unfortunately, with our current travel restrictions, I'm sat in Hounslow. That's an area of northwest London. You can see it coloured dark blue in the map. It's famous because we have Heathrow, which is named after Hounslow Heath on our doorstep. And we provide essentially a district general hospital, a, a general hospital service for both inpatients and outpatients. And you can see a picture of the hospital main entrance on the screen to your right. So we've got roughly about 600 beds. We provide a full range of general adult and maternity and pediatric services, including an intensive care unit service. Given how close we are to Heathrow and given the fact that actually we are um, in London, we have, I guess that, that might be quite difficult to say given recent political events with Europe, but we are generally a diverse population. So you can see about two thirds of our population are of white British background. And then we have a whole host of other ethnicities represented. And I think that's really important when it comes to thinking about how technology plays out in healthcare. So before I talked about our remote monitoring experience, I think it's really important that we think about the why do we want to do this? So I think in common with healthcare challenges across the globe, we've had a real challenge with identifying people who are deteriorating on our ward basis, and particularly sepsis has been a huge focus of our care quality and quality priorities. So every year the hospital will set out a set of targets or ambitions that we want to try and meet. And you can see some of those for 2019 on the screen here. Improving sepsis care was one of our top because we recognise that actually it's probably the biggest cause of deterioration in our ward bed base, either in the post-surgical population or in patients who come in via our medical pathways. And we recognise that actually it isn't just the detection that we were struggling with, and I think the detection is clearly a key part of that, but we also needed to look at how we respond to those, those findings. So we often found, for example, in our serious incident reports, that a theme that would come out is that junior staff and junior colleagues had documented or noticed something but had been unable to escalate that or manage that in a timely way. So we, like every other healthcare system, collect a whole lot of data to start with. So if you think about the data that we collect routinely that helps us manage our patients, we collect a lot of patient level data, we co collect their demographics, we collect their observations on a routine basis. And in the NHS system, we use a system called the News 2 score, which is mandated by the Royal College of Physicians, and I think has probably developed, devolved beyond the wider NHS setting. And we use this coupled with investigations, including from blood counts and blood cultures, to recognise when people are deteriorating and when they're unwell. But where we were clear that there was a real gap was around the monitoring that we provide, we're providing at the bedside and also in particular the support that we provide to our nursing colleagues who let's face it are the people that make or break our health systems and who are the unsung heroes of virtually every health system in the world. So this is a, my colleague Elizabeth who works with me on the cardiology wards and this is a photo is taken with the consent of the patient and with Elizabeth and what we're showing you is the portrait system that we have been testing and piloting out on our both our medical wards and our surgical wards. 
So the ECG dots you can ignore the cross the chest. They were put because we're on a cardiology ward where this picture is taken. But you can see the wearable system, the portrait system. Actually, this patient is wearing it. What's really unique about this system, I think, in compared to some of the others that I as an individual have worked with is the respiratory rate detection, the mechanism by which it's done, which I'll come back to in a moment, and also the ability to monitor oxygen levels and saturations in particular in a wearable and lightweight way. That's, I think, been brought increasingly to the fore as to its importance as we manage COVID as an acute illness and the concept of silent hypoxia is clearly very real as a phenomenon. So we were interested in understanding how we could use technology to augment the care that we were providing. And not only in COVID times, but generally, we find that staffing resources stretched and we felt that this might be a really good option in terms of trying to support colleagues to deliver the best care that they can. So to be absolutely clear, it was never meant to be about replacing healthcare professionals. It was about how do we improve the working environment so, as I said, the respiratory um, rate examination, I think that's come, that's been very obvious and clear from the talks that have already happened, is a key vital sign that I don't think we necessarily do very well. One of my research registrars says that the respiratory rate is always 20, isn't it? And that said slightly tongue in cheek, but I can imagine that if you've seen OBS charts or observation records from patients, you can sort of see where that comment comes from. And as I say, the GE portrait system has a significant advantage in the sense that it has two channels in which it measures respiratory rate. So at the top, you've got the abdominal channel and at the bottom, you've got the thoracic channel. And you can see the difference in the signal quality and the measurement that we'd be able to take from these. So why might the physiological parameter measurement be important? Clearly, we have systems and processes in place on every ward area. I've already mentioned the NEWS2 score, for example, that lets us detect patients when they're deteriorating. But what we found through the research work that we've done using digital sensors is actually probably that, and that physiological deterioration where someone is very obviously clinic, is cl clinically apparent is probably the tip of the iceberg. So this pie chart is derived from some data that the said PhD student with the respiratory rate uh, did as part of her thesis work. And what we were looking at is quantifying patient deterioration in a generally unselected cohort of me general medical and general surgical patients to look at who was triggering alerting and alarming thresholds set as per news two parameters. And you can see that a third of people triggered no alerts and no alarms, about a very small percentage, we had no data from the physiological sensors to be able to make that assessment. And traditionally, the figure that we've said is roughly about 15% of people will trigger an alert if you look at the wider data set as I've described already. So you can see that in our amber and red systems, we would start, we saw roughly about that percentage of people who were deteriorating, but there's a significant pool of patients approximately half, where they are starting to show signs of deterioration. I think this is a real key area for us to focus on, and that's probably where digital monitoring systems such as this really come into their own. So I've mentioned a little bit about some of the data that we're starting to uncover and how I think it might fit in, but clearly one of the key issues here is what do our patients think about this? What's their general approach? So we've tried to look at this throughout our work using two different approaches. So we've done some fairly detailed interviews with patients where we've sat down and essentially undertaken a thematic analysis. And these are the key themes that emerge. And you can see that generally speaking, patients are hugely positive about this sort of ward monitoring based system and the use of technology in, in this way. So there's clearly a key theme around safety that emerges. There's clearly a key theme that patients see this as the future of healthcare. There's no doubt that comfort and usability and wearability are a huge issue. But what I found really humbling in this survey and, an, and piece of research that we did is how much patients worried about the nursing colleagues and the nursing staff and how much they worried about the workload and that technology actually provided a better working environment for staff. 
and I think that's really humbling. I have to say, nobody talked about the doctors, everybody talked about the nurses, but I've already agreed that the nurses are the unsung heroes of healthcare, so I guess I'm not going to really complain that much. So in addition to the general thematic analysis, we also did some particular questionnaires. So every patient who wore these devices was asked to comment. And you can see that, for example, in terms of two responses that we asked for was about comfort. And I mentioned that was really important. You can see that actually patients don't really tend to agree that this sort of system is really comfortable. And I picked out some specific quotes, both because obviously they show the appreciation and the importance of how healthcare experience translates and all, but also how impressed patients were by the technology and the comfort. So it's not just about the patients. Clearly, these last couple of years have shown us how important staff experience is and actually how really key that is to be able to deliver really great patient experience and patient care is to ensure that the staff have, the, have a, an equally good experience. So the thematic analysis that I talked about was also done for staff. We did the same thing. We took about 50 staff to ask about their thoughts and experiences and beliefs around remote monitoring systems or digital monitoring on the wards, particularly in ward areas that wouldn't be used to this. And you can see that very similar sorts of themes are emerging or were became were obvious compared to what our patients had said. So again, the future formed a key part of that. There was a real recognition of safety issues. There was a real recognition of needing to improve outcomes. There was a real concern about the impact of care and the experience of that care. And staff were equally concerned about ensuring that workload and work and time could be better managed. So looking at the feedback for the portrait system in particular, you can see that, again, the staff were very positive about this. I don't think we have enough experience at the moment because we've only just started this work to understand about the ambulatory elements of this. But I think that will probably come from what I've seen in other systems, particularly in cardiology in terms of rhythm monitoring. But there's no doubt that staff are increasingly positive about this. So I have a huge number of thank yous to say I couldn't have done this work just by myself. There's a huge team who've started to, who've done this work and have supported us through this. I'm really happy to take any questions later on, but I couldn't stop without saying thank yous. I think that we've only just started to touch the surface of what this kind of technology might be able to do, and also in particular, what improvements in care it might be able to bring about. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sadia, for this excellent talk. I just learned that we probably lost the connection to our chairman, Ashish Khanna. Ashish, are you there? I guess he's not. So I think we will be able to bridge this problem and have a discussion among the three of us. I think the talks were just nicely building up one on top of each other. And um, well, what I would like to ask Frederick, perhaps first, um, what do you think when we discuss about patient monitoring? Is it a problem that we should mainly focus on in patients after surgery? Should we focus on patients on medical wards? Should we do all of this um, in parallel? So what, where would you begin when you had a hospital and would need to start uh, patient monitoring? Thank you, Bea, for the question and uh, the introduction. Um, it's it's a good question. Of course, uh, we discuss uh, we discussed in your presentation exclusively about uh, post-surgical patients because this is a congress for anesthesiologists. Uh, but we have a cardiologist on board today, and and I know uh, myself uh, that uh, it might be useful also in uh, infectious disease departments, in uh, respiratory departments, in many other actually wards. Uh, they are today uh, interested as well in upgrading the way they monitor patients. So it's not specifically for surgical patients, but it's probably a, a place uh, where it's easy to start 
because of all this, the studies you showed in your presentation, Bill, there is today evidence that at least for post-surgical patients, we miss adverse events by monitoring uh, vital signs from time to time. So we have the evidence, uh, we have the will to improve outcome. It's part of perioperative medicine. We have also opioid-induced respiratory depression, which is which is not specific to anesthesiologists because also in some medical departments, we, we use opioids, but, but clearly, you know, opioids are frequently used after surgery. Uh, we know it may be uh, associated with respiratory depression. So I think anesthesiologists are very well positioned to, um, to initiate the process, but I'm sure, of course, it will spread to other departments. I'm also convinced that anesthesiologists would be perfect to do post-operative ward monitoring, but perhaps Sadia has something to say against this. What is your cardiology perspective? So I would never dream of saying anything against an anesthesiologist, and nor do I as a cardiologist feel out of place. But I think going back to something Frederick said, actually every hospital, although we have, we're very similar in what we do, we all have slightly unique challenges and problems. From my perspective as a physician, particularly leading a medical directorate over the last couple of years, I think there are two things. One is that we can't we don't do this for everyone we've already tried that we know that doesn't work very well it doesn't add to the patient it doesn't add to the hospital but there's no doubt there's a huge cohort of patients who would benefit both in terms of improving care outcomes for them but also completely from a financial sense reducing the cost of that care to the trust and therefore being able to treat more people particularly in value-based and capitated systems and I think it doesn't matter who the what the background of the individual person is. Surgeons are well placed, anesthesiologists are well placed, physicians are well placed. Probably working together, we'd achieve the best outcomes for our patients. I couldn't agree really more. Well, further on, I would be very interesting how to how can we show in studies or trials that work monitoring actually affects postoperative or other patient-centered outcomes. So I always wonder if we need to come up with a perfect endpoint for a trial, what would it be? Would we detect more minor complications and less major complications? Are we even able to show reduction in mortality? What are your thoughts on this? So in, in, in my lecture, I shared with you already a few outcome studies uh, published. Uh, you probably noticed that all of them uh, use uh, the number of rapid response team events as, a, as an endpoint, if not the primary endpoint. And basically, all of them show a reduction. So I think it's probably the low-hanging fruit uh, from a research standpoint. I think we should not uh, initiate studies uh, with uh, in mind the possibility uh, or the dream to decrease mortality. Maybe it's going to happen. But uh, as mentioned uh, this morning during another session, we would need a huge number of patients to demonstrate mortality benefits. Uh, so I think, yes, decreasing the number of rapid response team uh, events or um, activations, uh, decreasing the number of ICU admission, I think would be also pretty realistic and would have uh, obviously a direct economic uh, benefit uh, and so that would help also to probably uh, speed up the implementation process, because we all know that we will have to face pushback from the administration, uh, new monitoring pieces, new equipment. So it's going to be very useful if we can show first that we can decrease the number of ICU admission. And I would agree entirely with those two things. I'd also add two other things. So from a physician's perspective and from a quality outcome, time to treatment is really key here, for example, for sepsis. So if we can demonstrate that treatment is received sooner with the monitoring, that's really important. And then from a hospital administrative point of view, length of stay is also key. So do are we able to get people home more quickly if we if we set up systems like this? I agree. Ashish, are you back? Is our chairman back? Yes, um, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, I'm having still having some video issues, but uh, again, uh, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate all the three talks, how you led us through. Uh, Bernd, you started us off with why we should be doing ward monitoring differently. And, and Frederick, you sort of built the, the rationale of how to do ward monitoring, how to manage alarms and and Sadia, how you followed the real world experience. The one question that came up uh, on Slido was data about ward monitoring and outcomes from the pediatric population. And as um, uh, one of our uh, audience members from Portugal asks that question, 
Does any one of you have any experience with, with the pediatric population? Should we be um, focusing on the pediatric population at all? So Ashish, although I'm an adult physician, I have pediatric colleagues in my hospital and we've started to talk about that. So they're about to start something this winter looking at respiratory viruses because we expect RSV to be hitting the NHS at the same time as COVID. I don't have any data to share, but it will definitely come. Sure. I, I also wanted to go back to Bern and, and ask him this. Uh, you talked, Bern, about the whole spectrum, you know, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, blood pressure. Um, people often ask, you know, the ideal monitoring system, um, how would you grade these changes in vital signs? Like where should the clinician really focus attention when, when looking at continuous monitoring out of all of the whole, whole spectrum that you talked about? That is a very good question. I think, first of all, it's important that we have systems that are able to monitor um, various, if not all, vital signs that we are interested in. I think a prerequisite that uh, clinical implementation can be successful is that clinicians do not need to handle a couple of different monitoring systems for each single vital sign. So we need integrated systems that have sensors, probably a couple of sensors per system, that are able to record an, uh, a number of vital signs. For sure, respiratory rate is important. It has been shown that respiratory rate is a very, very good predictor of clinical deterioration. Um, as some may know, I personally think that uh, blood pressure is a very important vital sign. So blood pressure monitoring is important, but I would even say that it's the most complex vital sign to measure on the normal ward because sensor technology uh, especially with a good measurement performance is, is, not, is not easily available, let's put it that way. Heart rate definitely tells you something, but of course depends a lot on what you are doing. So I think what is also important next to those classic vital signs, we need to know the context, what is the patient doing? So we need to have uh, information about body position, for example, and stuff like this. So there are many vital signs that give us information if you combine those and therefore the systems need to measure various vital signs at a time. Yeah, interesting, Bern. And, and, and clearly, you know, there is no perfect monitor. I'm gonna go to Frederick next. Uh, so so Bern gives us, you know, sort of, you know, his vision of this. Um, if you were to now put a monitoring system in a, in a new hospital environment, um, how would you sort of make sure it's a recipe for success? You know, you talked about alarm management. Our colleagues in the nursing world are all worried about alarm fatigue. How do we make things better for ourselves? Yeah, it's a good point. I think there is a gap, uh, still a gap between technology uh, improvement and uh, successful clinical adoption. Uh, but it's probably more a question for Sadia, but I, I, can, I can share with you uh, first what I think uh, briefly. Uh, particularly regarding alarms, you know, in my lecture, I explained there are different ways we have to be creative. We should think differently uh, and not deal with alarms as we do today in the OR and the ICU. In the OR, there is someone sitting uh, just next to the monitor. It's basically the same in the ICU. We, 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 are, we remain very close, or at least the nurse is, is always very close to the monitor. And so on the wards, if we want to prevent alarm fatigue, which is uh, really the worst we could imagine because if it happens, all these new technologies that potentially may really help us to, uh, to, to improve outcome will be rejected by the medical and the nurse community. So, so we need to ensure that alarms are filtered. And you know, I just mentioned the fact that by increasing uh, the annunciation delay and by using the median value, uh, we can eliminate uh, many artifacts. Uh, there are smart software, as you can imagine, artificial intelligence, you know, you know that better than me because I know you do a lot of work on this topic, uh, Ashish, uh, but with very smart software, we can further improve the way we detect uh, artifacts. Uh, and so we need to personalize as well uh, alarm settings. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to use the same uh, blood pressure threshold during the day or during the night. Uh, Bern did a very nice study recently in anesthesiology showing the blood pressure is, of course, much lower during the night. So we need really to rethink uh, these alarm settings uh, if we want to be sure these systems are going to be accepted by, uh, by hospitals and by clinicians. 
Thank you, Frederick. Uh, again, you know, I, 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 I'm always fascinated with, with the implementation science part of continuous monitoring as we continue to evolve in this area. Um, I'm going to round this out with, with a question for, for Sadia. Thank you for thank you for providing the patient perspective. That's really, really important. And congratulations for what seems to be a successful implementation of the GE monitoring system in, in your hospital. How about nursing and, and uh, doctors' perceptions of continuous monitoring? Was your hospital successful in 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 sort of encouraging positive positivity around continuous monitoring? Thanks so much for the question. So I think there are three elements to that, one of which Frederick's already said. So the alarm management here is really key. So we'd spent a lot of time before trying to understand what alarm systems we should have and how the triggers and thresholds should work. So Frederick, you said five minutes. We've sort of worked out that actually you can go out as far as 10. And what we know from the physiology on the wards is actually people have very transient disruptions in physiology over and above the errors that the sensors give us with measuring thresholds and artifacts that probably self-rectify. We're not looking at the same types of pathology immediately the same that happens in an ICU or in an OR setting out in the wards. So there is some that the alarm management is really key. The second issue that's really key is the co-design. So this sort of technology implementation isn't about the kit, it's about the people. So it's about how do you sell a vision about what the future is for patients and as healthcare professionals, whether we're nurses or doctors, we all coalesce around our passion and commitment to the care of patients. So a system that's QI based and is co-produced that has a very clear focus on patients for healthcare staff is the only way to go in my opinion. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, you know, we can talk about this all day, but I, I truly appreciate you guys today and I appreciate you, uh, you know, uh, appreciate the audience. I, I apologize for slight technical problems on my end. But again, um, Dr. Sadia Khan, uh, Dr. Frederick Michard and, and uh, uh, Professor Sagal, a great session. And uh, thank you everyone for joining today. I hope everyone's learned more about continuous monitoring and hope everyone's going to keep doing uh, more research, more science with continuous monitoring as we continue to improve patient outcomes. Thank you, um, and uh, we'll wrap this up now.